be here. We are, we are commuting in our marriage. <laughs> and after 36 years, it's still working. We're, we're still happy, I believe. <laughs> so we hook, up, we hook up every once in a while. <laughs> um, and to your distinguished pastor, she probably won't, won't say this, um, but she is one of the leading women in the Air National Guard. I said to her, you're probably the senior ranking female, and she said, I don't think so, but we're going to check the record. I think she's probably one of the two senior ranking females in the Air National Guard, which is no small feat. Uh, to your coordinators or chairpersons, Corporal Gant and Captain, I mean Corporal um, Jackson, and Captain Gant, who um, he emailed me the other night uh, asking about uh, today's sermon, and I said to him, I'll get back to you Friday, I've got to travel, and then I decided that night to go ahead and respond to him. He seemed like, he seemed like somebody who needed uh, a response to not delay. <laughs> he wears a star as well. So. Um, and to my niece and nephew, by marriage, but we don't, we, we get rid of that by marriage stuff. We just have niece and nephew who um, uh, Mr. Anthony Robinson and, and Montrose Robinson he is a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States uh, Army. And he is still currently serving. He is now on the staff of, of Bowie State as a recruiter. So if any of you are looking for scholarships in the Army ROTC, she can hook you up. To this lovely youth choir. Uh, and a number seven, somebody said, seven join the choir. I said, seven? I said, that's your name. Yes. So you know the choir. And then um, some of the other uh, persons, Trinity is another name. Yeah. I was getting names uh, earlier. Dominique, Dominique. Yeah. Christopher, okay, I was getting names this morning when they were talking. But it is, it is my honor to be here with you. Um, I... I'm excited about your worship. I, I didn't expect this, uh, this kind of worship. But I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by it. I, when I came in, when we came upstairs uh, from prayer with the choir, one of the urchins said to me, you look happy. <laughs> I said, I am happy. I'm very happy to be here, to always, to not only travel to meet new, new friends, travel to meet new members of the Avery Zion Church, travel to meet, uh, to, to celebrate the wonderful things that our veterans are doing. I am very excited. I'm honored to be president, the new second president of Philadelphia Logical Seminary. So if any of you are interested in going to seminary, I, I can help you with that. So uh, we'd be delighted to have you. The scripture that I want to focus on this morning is found in the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, uh, the verse 17. And I'll read verse 16 and 17, coming from the New Living Translation. I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals beneath and forge and makes the weapons of destruction. I've created the armies that destroy. But in the coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. And everyone who tells lies in court will be brought to justice. Yes. Those benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me, the Lord I have spoken. And I want to read the English Standard Version of verse 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you will succeed. You shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the Lord, of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. 
I want to talk, uh, and I don't use, you hear preachers say, I'm going to talk briefly. <laughs> you should beware, but I do want to share with you this morning on the topic, Real Weapons, Real Warriors. Real Weapons and Real Warriors. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for the privilege of safe travel. Thank you for the privilege of a welcoming congregation who is eager to hear your word. Let us not waste this moment, Lord. Teach us, guide us, hold us up, strengthen us, guide us, and send us on our way to carry out your mission. Amen. Amen. As I said earlier, I applaud your distinguished pastor and give thanks to her for this generous invitation. One of the proudest of my moments in the Air Force and the Air National Guard service was that when I arrived in the Air National Guard a number of years ago, there were only two female chaplains, and there were only a handful of African Americans in that group. And by the grace of God, when I left in 2006, we had 15 women and 25 African Americans. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored to say that I had a small part in helping make that a reality. God is extremely good. I hope you know that. God's mercy is everlasting. And God's truth endures through all generations. So it means that God's goodness was here before we got here. And God's goodness will go on before we leave. It is our task is to leave God's goodness where it is and move on. I'm happy today to share in this word as you honor our distinguished veterans and you celebrate them those who served honorably and with distinction. And it is my privilege to be here to share and to affirm that. I'm also here to tell you that we are in a battle, if you don't know. As Christians, we are in a daily battle. You should wake up in the morning knowing that you, and one of your scriptures that you read, talked about putting on the whole armor of God. So you should rise up in the morning as you brush your teeth and drink, eat your breakfast and put on your clothes. Imagine that you're putting on war, war gear because we are in a battle. It is a battle against a right versus wrong. It is a battle of love versus hate. It is a battle of justice versus injustice. It is a battle of darkness versus light. It is a battle of peace versus violence. Those of you who spend any time reading and digesting the Word of God and know that it is filled with episodes and examples of where war occurred. You see, you can't read your Bible and not know that war is something that happens all the time. There are battles and there are warriors. Read it from the Bible, from the start, even from the Garden of Eden, to Revelation, it is a battle, it is a struggle. In fact, most of the journeys of faith reflect ordinary human beings who battle with the forces of evil with the best of their heart, with the best of their soul, with the best of their mind, and ultimately with the aid of spiritual power and divine authority. Amen. It is a battle for allegiance. And when I say allegiance, it means we have to do battle with what we are going to love. Who are we going to love? What are, what's going to occupy our souls, our hearts? What do we worship? That is a battle. Where we worship, that becomes a battle. How we avoid the hells on earth. And how do we work to foster the coming of the kingdom of God? We won't answer all those questions here this morning, but I want you to know that there are real weapons and there are real warriors. Amen. You heard in the earlier video that we saw, it is the challenge 
of believing. And I imagine that many of you have quoted the scripture that I used this morning. You've heard it quoted. You've heard it sung about. But I wonder if you, in fact, believe it. Do you believe that scripture that says no weapon? Yes. No weapon. Yes. Not one that is formed against you shall prosper, yes. shall succeed. Yes. Do you wake up in the morning with that prayer or with that thought that there is nothing that's going to happen today that is going to overcome you? Yes. I wake up in the morning, I know there's work to do, there's people to meet, faculty to deal with, but I wake up knowing that there is nothing that's going to happen that day that is going to overcome me. Nothing, zilch, not no weapon. Doesn't mean that they're not going to come at you. But ultimately they're not going to succeed. So you heard that true war story that was shared with you about the hell fighters. After all, Christ said to Peter in Matthew 16, 8, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, Peter was the original hell fighter. And on this Veterans Day Sunday, I want to challenge all of you to consider the question, is my faith worth fighting for? Is your faith, do you have the kind of faith that can do battle in the world? We know that our airmen, our soldiers, our sailors, our merchant marines, our airwomen, our marines, our coast guard fought and thought the United States was worth fighting for. But the Harlem Hellfighters, I want to talk a little bit about the Harlem Hellfighters and compare them a little bit to what we do in our faith. This predominantly black 306 Infantry Regiment spent more time in continuous combat, 191 days than any other American regiment in war and never had a man captured by the enemy. They fought heroically and suffered tremendous casualties. They, yet they were unknown by the majority of Americans back home. Let's see for a moment as Christians who are observing Veterans Day in 2014 what we can learn from these Harlem Hell Fighters, these real Hell Fighters as they were named. First of all, they had to join the French Army to prove their value as Americans. Now that is amazing. You have to leave home and go somewhere else to prove your worth. There's a lesson there for us people of faith. You may not always be appreciated for your worth, but you must trust that whatever you do, wherever you go, that the righteous will not be forsaken. And that you must trust that what God has placed in your heart well, will come to pass. Amen. So when you're catching little hell at work or at school, trust that God will see you through it. Amen. The second thing that the Harlem Hell Fighters teach us that they began as a provisional New York Air National Guard regiment. And where did they train? They trained in the streets. They didn't even have a place to train. It took a crisis to make them official. In 1916, the New York Air National Guard was deployed to Texas to address a threat by the Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa. You know, you probably all heard about Pancho Villa. But guess who they sent? I mean, guess what happened after Pancho Villa was doing business in Texas? They sent the guard from New York, but they left New York unprotected. So Attorney William Haywood dusted off the law that had established the Black and National Guard, or the National Guard, and then he signed the bill which made 
the regiment real. The, le the lesson there is that as the soldiers of the cross, that's what we are as people of faith. We are soldiers of the cross. Sometimes, and this was read too in your scripture, and I didn't give them that to read about Moses, but you have to believe what Moses said to the people of God well, when they were facing a crisis. Well, Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, prepare yourself, be ready, because when God picks the lock on the locked door, yeah. you have to be ready to go in. Yeah. The third thing that I learned from these Harlem Hellfighters, as World War II started in 1917, the National Guard units were activated. The 15th New York unit was one of them. But guess what? They caught hell before they left American soil. In basic training in Spartanburg, South Carolina, they encountered racial prejudice from the white citizens and from their own fellow soldiers. That's amazing, isn't it? In one incident, there was a musician in the group who was physically attacked and thrown out of the hotel for attempting to buy a newspaper. When the 15th unit arrived in Camp Mills, New York, Commander Hamilton Fish, who actually happened to be the founder of the, of the uh, American Legion, learned of a plot by some of the white soldiers to attack this unit. So they really had to get them out of the country. The amazing lesson here that I want to share is that Jesus speaks about the disrespect that we will often get with people who are supposed to be our friends. The Gospel of Matthew tells us in the 13th chapter, and they took offense to Jesus. He was one of their own, but they took offense to him. And so, brothers and sisters, don't be surprised when you're trying to do right and justice that people take offense to what you're trying to do. The fourth thing that I learned, or lesson that I learned from the Harlem Hellfighters, is that they got little training before boarding the ships to France. They were put on the USS Pocahontas. And guess what? That ship was so raggedy, it broke down twice before they got there. <laughs> the ship finally got there, but the people of faith, you have to remember, when the storms of life are raging, God does in fact stand by you. So when you're in a storm, don't focus on the storm. Focus on the Savior that has seen you for the storm. All right? People ask me and say, well, you know, and I, and I appreciate that lovely, those lovely uh, comments that were made about my, my pilgrimage, professional pilgrimage, but I've been in some storms. But I had to keep my mind focused on what my objective was. And so, that's very important. The fifth thing that I learned from these Harlem Hellfighters, these real warriors, when they arrived at the port of Brest in France in December 1917, the regimental band got off the ship and they began an impromptu concert. They played so well that when they finished, they got a standing ovation from the French people that had come to hear them. So the lesson that I want to glean from that experience is that when you are in a fight and standing for goodness and God's mercy, God's word says your gifts, your gifts will make room for you. You see? So use the gifts that God has given you. Your gifts will make room for you. The sixth thing that I want to say that I learned from these 
Harlem Hell Fighters. They trained and believed that they were going overseas to fight. But when they got there, they were made to be laborers, mm -hmm. unloading ships. But guess what happened? General Pershing said to these young men, no, they, were, they were left like orphans on a doorstep when they got to France. The lesson there is as people of God, we have to be reminded to rehearse the words that nobody knows the trouble I see. Yeah. Nobody knows my sorrow. Yeah. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows like Jesus. All right. So eventually, they got into the fight, yeah. as you saw earlier on the video. When the 15th arrived, changes happened. They were designated the 369th Infantry Regiment, which was assigned to the 185th Brigade and was newly designated. The new regiment was attached to the 16th Division of the French 4th Army, and the weary French soldiers warmly embraced them. They were tired. The French were tired. They were ready to probably leave combat. In the French army, these American soldiers saw more combat, their share of combat, in 191 days. They fought so well that their French comrades named them. They didn't give that name to themselves. Just like the Tuskegee Airmen called the Red Tail Angels. They didn't give that name to themselves. The Germans gave them that name because they were angels. They saved they're high. So these men were named the Harlem Hellfighters. One battlefield incident that I want to share with you, and you saw a part of it, Private Henry Johnson and Needham Rogers, they were at a listening post in no man's land. Both were attacked by a 24-man German platoon. Both of them were shot. Johnson, the video didn't show that. He was shot three times. He got up. He fired his three-shot rifle. The rifle. These ain't not machine guns. Shot. He shoots three times. He shot his three, his, his three shots from his rifle. When his rifle stopped shooting, he took the butt of his gun and he started beating the German, I mean, the, uh, the, beating the, uh, the Germans. When his rifle broke up and shattered, he took out a bolo knife. Now, I'm not arguing that Christians should go around and get their guns out. And I want you to leave here saying the preacher said, get a shotgun and get your knife. But I'm just telling you the story of Johnson, what he did. He took out his bolo knife and he started slashing the German soldiers, as many of them as he could reach. And I imagine after a little while, there were 24 of them from the start. After he took down so many, the rest of them said, this brother must be crazy. And they took off and they ran. When they realized they could not subdue him. You imagine? Being shot three times wow. out of your weapon, you're using your, your hand and your knife and you're still fighting. He says to me, and then what he did in the end, when the Germans uh, uh, took off running, he threw, threw the grenades that he had. <laughs> For all of this, initially, he was not recognized by the United States military. Ah! But the French recognized him. They gave him the cross of Gilead for his bravery. The black community here back in America sent President Woodrow Wilson a letter telling him that the first hero of this war, like Christmas Addicts in the American Revolution, was a black man. You imagine that? World War I, 
therefore he should recognize him. And by the way, they told him he should do something about the lynching of black men in America. These hell fighters pushed the German army back to Hindenburg and they led the Allies on the Rhine. When they returned to New York in February 1919, oh, they got a big, you saw the big parade on Fifth Avenue, they were given a parade because they had helped win World War I. The lesson for us as people of faith. And although James Weldon Johnson likely did not have the Harlem Hellfighters in mind when he penned the words to lift every voice and sing, well. I believe his words teach us about how and what being a modern day hellfighter, faith fighter, is all about. And he said it, said it in the second board verse of that wonderful hymn that we call the Negro National Anthem. Yes. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, fell to the days when hope unborn had died. Yeah. Yet with a steady beat had not our weary feet strayed from the places yeah. of God where our fathers yeah. and mothers and mothers sighed. Yes. We have come what? Over the way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the swamp. You can imagine Johnson slashing yeah. at those Germans, you know, being shot three times. He's fighting for his life. And finally, they realize this brother has some special power behind him. As people of faith, when you fight, people realize they are, they're going to come at you. Believe me, they're going to come at you. I don't care who you are. You can be the president. Yes. 
we act on our own. God bless you and strengthen you.
the truth and the love of God go with you. May you wake up in the morning knowing that you're covered with the whole armor, that you are preparing for battle, and that Christ, the, the general of, of the world, goes before you, now and forevermore. Amen.